Hi everyone, welcome. My name's Andrea. And what I do is I am a teacher. I am also a brain gym instructor and a yoga instructor. Over the years, over the last 20 years, I've learned and implemented how to use specific movement in the classroom to lessen learning disabilities and in some cases eliminate them. I now have a program for parents that they can do at home called Movement for Miracles, where I take all of the knowledge I've been gaining for the last 20 years and I put it in a sequential program that lasts eight weeks long. More information about that is below or you can go to andreafry.com. In this video, I present to you an hour-long interview that I had the great honor and opportunity to have with Dr. Carla Hannaford. I started studying Dr. Carla, Carla Hannaford's work probably about hmm, 20 years ago, and she has influenced my teaching and my parenting. I'm just going to show you the books that Carla has written. So I started my journey with her with Smart Moves, then read Awakening the Child Heart. Uh, from there, I read and studied the dominance factor, and from there, playing in the unified field. So all of her books, what I love about it, I've been a teacher for like over 20 years in the school system, and a lot of fads come and go, but this work is organic. It talks about true infant development, true child development, and what really helps children learn. And to sim sum it all up and simplify it, it is movement. But in this interview, I really hope you get the, the nuances and get the deep meanings and the things that she talks about. And I really hope you enjoy. Make sure to comment below, reach out with questions. My gratitude to Carla for doing this with me. My goal in sharing this is to open up the door for people to understand the importance of movement and not just random, sometimes very specific movement can really make a difference in, in the outcome of a child's learning and being. Enjoy. So for people who don't know you, because of course I've purchased all your books and read them many times, but people who don't know you, could you just kind of give a little story about who you are and um, how you sort of came to want to share all this wonderful information that you have to help other people? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so my PhD is in neurophysiology and I've been teaching forever. I started teaching in the 1960s and like anatomy and physiology and biology. And uh, in 1986, um, I had been using super learning in my university classrooms and uh, at the University of Hawaii. And I was invited to do a, um, some work with the intermediate school there in Kona uh, with the kids that were having problems, the CSAP kids in intermediate. And like I told you yesterday, I thought, what a great opportunity I could be with my daughter as a single parent. And because she was just going into the intermediate school and she was mortified I would do this to her, you know. It was, and interestingly enough, I ended up actually working with a lot of her friends because they were kind of the mavericks and the, you know, the ones that were doing other things and being more creative. <laughs> and so this became a, a little nine-week pilot project. And right before I started it, I took a Touch for Health class uh, because like I told you, back in the 1970s, they had given scholarships to um, nurses that were in the hospitals there to take Touch for Health. So they were using Touch for Health in the hospitals in Denver at that time. So I took the Touch for Health class, and then the woman that taught it, nurse practitioner that taught it, said, if you're going to work with these kids, you need to know brain gym. And she showed me four movements. That's it. So one of them was the, what we call the hookups, 
or pretzel, where you cross your arms over, uh, put your hands, thumbs down, cross one hand over the other, roll them under, relax the shoulders away from the ears. That was one of them. Unrolling the earlobes from top to bottom was another. Cross crawling, which is just basically walking, but it's touching the opposite leg with the opposite hand. So you're crossing the midline of the body and activating both hemispheres. And the last one was the infinity eight, you know, for writing, but also for eyes, to get the eyes moving. So I had these students come in and in the uh, Georgie Lazarnoff super learning, we had a beat a second music in the background, which increased alpha brainwave activity and uh, had that going. And then I'd have them do these activities. And about a week and a half in, here comes the English teacher, and she says, what are you doing with Jesse? And I showed her oh, a little of this and some of this. And, yeah. <laughs> and I said, why? And she says, he offered to read in class. And I said, well, great. And she says, you don't know Jesse, do you? And like I said, they had given me the folders of all these students, but I'm teaching full-time at the university and doing this part-time job. And as a single parent, I never got to looking at the folders. Thank goodness. So I had no preconceived notion. And for a scientist, that's really important. So I do remember when Jesse came in, I, I asked her, she said, he had offered to read in class, and she was amazed. And I remember when Jesse came in, I thought, he's a little older, but I didn't know. He was 17. He'd been held back and held back and held back. And according to his teachers, he couldn't read. Well, when he came to me, I said, what do you want to work on? He said, reading. And I said, what are you interested in? He said, motorcycles. Back in the 60s, I had a 650 North. So we went over to the library and we got some magazines on motorcycles and did these activities and had him read. And here he was offering to read. Well, then all these other teachers started coming to me and saying, what are you doing with Leilani? Or what are you doing with Miley? What are you doing with, you know, all of these students? And I said, well, a little of this, <laughs> some of this, and I was amazed. And uh, so was the principal. The principal asked me to show the teachers what I was doing, so I did. But I needed to know why. It was really imperative for me. And so in that November, this, uh, this pilot started in September, and I have to tell you that they got the funding for me to do this for the next, so I did it for four years at the intermediate school. But in November, uh, Colleen Gardner and Patty Stirr came to the Big Island to do the in-depth class of the Brain Gym, which was my first class to take. <laughs> this was in 1986. And I saw things happen in that class that I knew neurologically couldn't happen. From my understanding, I was blown away. And um, you know, one instance was a fellow in his 40s who was a musician, but had cr very crossed eyes. And after a, an in-depth balance, his eyes were straight, the first time in his whole life. And I was like, what is going on? I'm asking them, and they said, just trust it works. <laughs> and I had seen that it was working. I just needed to know why. And I started looking in the literature, and there wasn't much at that time. Now it's all over the place. If you pick up any magazine or, you know, any of the scientific journals, one of the main things they're saying is movement is essential for learning. It's the key to it. So, um, but at that time, it wasn't there. What they thought was this was the most important, and we needed to keep the body still because it was a distraction. Mm -hmm. You know, so sit still and be quiet and learn. Well, 
I was seeing that that wasn't working <laughs> and that this other was, this brain gym stuff was just working and it was amazing. So as I started pulling together my understanding as a neurophysiologist of what's important, I realized the, the motor cortex here of the brain and the sensory cortex for proprioception, very important for fine motor and a big area for the hands, which takes 20 years to fully develop these hands. The other area that kept coming up was the cerebellum. And um, interestingly enough, way back, you know, when I first started looking at uh, biology and physiology and that sort of thing. We knew <laughs> that the cerebellum had to do with gross movement. Well, now we know that it's not just gross movement, it activates all, it, it modulates all the functions of the neocortex of the brain, the rest of the brain. And there are more nerve endings in the cerebellum, more nerve connections an average is 30,000 connections per nerve cell in the cerebellum, more nerve cell connections than in the whole rest of the brain combined. So that's an important, important area of the brain. So movement. So just following through, you know, I, I started putting together information that looked relevant and then started putting it into I needed to write. I just felt like I needed to write about this, and that's where Smart Moves came into being. And, um, you know, since then, the first edition of Smart Moves came out, I believe, in 1994, something around there. And um, that was basically what I was putting together, what made sense to me from the, all the work that I had done up to that point. And by the way, the next year after I was in the intermediate school, the uh, principal from the elementary school asked if I would be the counselor for special ed. There's 28 kids in special ed and I was like, yes, another laboratory. So like I told you yesterday, at <laughs> I was doing half time at the intermediate, half time at the elementary school, full time at the university as a single parent. I was younger and that helped, <laughs> but I was fascinated to see what could happen and saw real miracles happen. I had a little girl uh, that had been thrown against a wall when she was just six months old and uh, it had caused a lot of damage in her brain. And so she, she kind of walked like a, a CP, a cerebral palsy person, could hardly walk and couldn't read, couldn't write. She was 10. And um, she was in a self-contained classroom with five boys that were considered violent. And um, they had two teachers, you know, that were always kind of monitoring these kids. And so I would take three of them at recess so that one of the teachers could go to the bathroom, you know, and, and uh, I was doing the brain gym with them, and I, you don't, you know, when you see a kid every day, you don't notice the changes, but the mother called me, and she said that she'd taken this, this girl, and it's the first story in Smart Moves, my book, but taken this little girl to her pediatrician, and the pediatrician was overwhelmed with the fact that she was talking in full sentences. And that she was walking better. And I hadn't even noticed. Mm -hmm. And by the end of that year, she was reading at grade level. It was phenomena. Yeah. Just a total phenomenon. All we were doing, they come up and we do brain gym. And then we go out and play ball for a little bit. And uh, it, just amazing. Simple, simple things that activate whole brain function. So... Mm -hmm. That was the beginning of Smart Moves. And since then, I think this is important. In 1999, Gerd Kepperman and Fred Gage at the University of California discovered that we are actually growing new nerve cells till the day we die. Now, up until that point, again, 
we were thinking this is the most important. And I, I don't know, I attended and taught, spoke at many brain conferences, but 1999 something happened. When they said that, that, that here we were growing new nerve cells, um, in Marion's Diamonds Laboratory, um, one of the students from there started looking at this because 30 years earlier, Marion Diamond had put out a paper that I looked at that was quite interesting. And they were looking at enriched environments, how you learn best, but this was with rats and mice. And what they found is that these rats and mice were growing new nerve cells. And she made a statement in there, ah, humans must be too. And we went, no, we're not mice and rats. Well, <laughs> here we were finding the same thing in humans. So Henrietta von Prague, her student, did a, a research on what is it in an enriched environment that caused these nerve cells to grow. And what do they find? Running wheels, cross-lateral integrated movement, walking, this, the cross-crawl that we, we do in brain gym. Uh, and that that was it. So now, if you go to a conference, they're body-mind conferences. They're not brain conferences. <laughs> and it's the body, we realize, that's doing it all through the movement. So vital. Um, so anyway, that's, that came into my understanding. And then, of course, we'll talk about this, I think, but then I started working with the Heart Math Institute and Roland McCready. And that was fascinating when we realized the heart actually controls the brain, not the other way around. So. Well, that is really interesting because, okay, so I've read... Um, the heart math solution and tried some of the techniques and stuff, but I didn't actually know that you worked with them. And for people who don't know what that is, because I don't think that understanding the heart connection with the brain is common knowledge for people to be honest mm -hmm. yet. So what's <laughs> here's what's interesting. I mean, back in the night, 1962, Dr. Armoir, that's a great name for a cardioanatomist at Yale University, uh, wrote a big article in Scientific American talking about the fact that there are 80% more nerve fibers going from the heart to the brain than the other way around. And that basically all that comes from the brain to the heart is the vagus nerve, which slows the heart down a little bit. And then in the 70s, two major researchers discovered hormones that only the heart produces. And the one cardioandrogenergic factor um, actually stimulates, it, it modulates all the functions of the body via the pituitary. In other words, it's the, it's the main hormone coming from the heart, and it's the main hormone. Uh, it's, so the heart's an endocrine gland, and it's the main hormone that's controlling all these functions via the pituitary. So the pituitary isn't the master gland, the heart is. The other is intrinsic cardiac androgenergic factor, which helps to modulate dopamine production, which is really important for learning, and um, adrenaline the function of adrenaline. So <laughs> the heart is so important. If you go to heart math, you can find white papers on it. But I, ha I have to tell you a story about this because this is interesting. And I've been working with Roland a bit, you know, and I wrote a book called Awakening the Child Heart. Okay. And that was the first one that I really put in the heart math work. And that's when I was working with Roland. And uh, they have a biofeedback mechanism you can put on your computers that has a, a waterfall and a little stream that runs and then flowers that bloom and a Bambi that pronks around. 
So they're using the R lead on an EKG, which is right on the middle finger, left middle finger, to find out when the heart comes to a coherent uh, pattern. Okay, a heart rate variability pattern that is coherent. And that occurs when you're not under stress. When you're under stress, it's incoherent. So, um, the, and it takes them, well, I won't go into that, but so this, this biofeedback mechanism, he was telling me about it, and I thought, this is really cool. So I was going to give a keynote address at an Eric Jensen conference, and right there, before you go into the main hall, the big hall, they had it set up with the computer, and I thought, cool, I'm going to try this out because, you know, I was a little nervous about the keynote and that sort of thing, big conference. So I put the lead on here, on my middle finger, and went into hookups, tongue on the roof of my mouth, five seconds. Five seconds. The waterfall ran, the stream ran, the flowers bloomed, Bambi prompted around, and the guy said, what are you doing? And I said, hookups. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. <laughs> what, what was interesting to me, I love this, is they teach a, a method called cut through, which is an NLP method. And uh, what you're doing is you're thinking of a nice place, and it takes about 10 minutes to come to coherence. And they, it's great. They go around the world, and they teach this to big corporations, which is great, and it gets money for their research. But we can do this, and what we're doing is coming back to alignment. When we're under stress, the non-dominant side of the brain shuts down by 75 to 85 percent. So that what we do is we react. We can't think. We can't be creative. We can't. It, it's also difficult to go to those those deep emotions like altruism, compassion, empathy, love, because the frontal lobes shut way down. And uh, what we're doing is we by doing this action there are so many nerve endings here in the motor and sensory cortex that we're forcing to come back into action so we're forcing the brain into an integrated state within our bodies it's simple movements it's that simple and uh, once we do that we stop that adrenaline cortisol rush that comes with stress or survival and now we can see the big picture and the details and put them together and think, remember, create. It's magic. And we do it all in our body. We don't have to have machinery or pills or a lot of psychotherapy. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's pretty amazing. So... In your books, this is a bit of a side note with the story I wanted to tell, but I, I haven't really found an author that takes these movements and explains it physiologically. Like you said, there's lots out there, but I would say there's a lot of things that tell me the big picture, but not so much exactly what's going on. Uh-huh. What do you think? Okay. Well... For one thing, it's the cerebellum. You know, the more you move, the more you're activating the cerebellum, which is connected to the vestibular system. The vestibular system is the entryway into the brain, and it comes through the, the semicircular canals of the inner ear, the macule and the saccule. And it is so important, this system, that when you look at an embryo, by one month after conception, those semicircular canals are forming. That's the first system that is really forming well and totally formed by nine weeks. And uh, these semicircular canals then go in and activate the cerebellum, which then activates the reticular activating system, which is a reticulum of nerves at the base of the brain and the brain stem that go up 
and it says, wake up, learning is coming, and it actually wakes up the brain to take in sensory information. And uh, it gets the eyes moving, and uh, it, there's a lot of connections in there anyway, so this, this vestibular system. So whenever we move our head, we're activating that vestibular system. And our eyes, as long as our eyes are moving, we are taking in information. When we stare, we're gone. <laughs> but they're connected. They're all connected. Okay? So the vestibular system, the cerebellum, this is an interesting thing. If you feel under here and do this, you feel the ligaments of the tongue move. Okay, when a baby is nursing, this system is so important that these ligaments are actually activating the vestibular system and helping to grow that system. Now, the vestibular system, at first, in the embryo, has to do with sound. So again, sound is really important. So just the sound, it's, our hearing is perfect at birth, absolutely perfect. And it's the last sense to go at death. And it's the thing that the child takes in information by. They don't see the way we do. In fact, they don't see the way we do until approximately 15 months after birth. And seeing is an interesting thing. Only 4% of vision comes through the eye. The rest is manufactured in our brain from our other senses. And what do babies do? This is real sensory. This is real sensory. Everything goes right here. And so they're getting a sensory input about their world and making it up in their brain. Okay? Now, <laughs> I know that sounds crazy, but if you look at a picture uh, of something, uh, like I have a picture here of Molly with uh, the oyster pickers. So here's this woman that's out in the sea picking oysters. If I look at that picture, I can see a woman picking oysters in the sea. But I'm making it up in my head because all it is is color on a flat sheet of canvas. So we do this. We, we organize our vision through all of our other senses. Hearing is vital. So a baby, when you lay it on the floor or on, on a bed, it'll turn its dominant ear up to hear. And what happens, too, is that some of the very earliest reflexes have to do the tonic neck reflex because they're lying with their dominant ear out. And then one of their first reflexes is to do this. Tonic neck reflex so that they've got both ears available. And then what we think is that they're seeing, but what they're really doing is they're getting both ears available to hear. And uh, <laughs> car seats are horrible where they cover the ears, you know, they need to hear. Yeah. So we just touched on something. Could you, I don't know how briefly you can explain this or overview of, but can you just talk about reflex movements like infant reflex movements and the importance of them in development and what that is because i my understanding is that it's huge and a lot of the brain gym movements sort of consider that exactly i mean I, the, our first some of our first reflexes the first one is a withdrawal reflex and that occurs about two weeks after conception but then by nine weeks we have the moral reflex which is a startle reflex, you know, that the baby does, but also we do when there's a sudden change in our environment that's frightening. And it's this, and then it's this, and it's a protective re reflex. What happens, and then there's all sorts, there's the spinal glon, there's all these reflexes that develop, well, in utero, and then as the baby is developing outside they need to be able to move they need to be they have to have floor time they have to be on their bellies on the floor and uh, so that they can lift their heads and do this 
tonic neck reflex and they can then and if you'll notice babies they're moving from their core and what they're doing is with these reflexes they're or helping to organize their whole motor system and once they get this once it's in what we say integrated into their motor system then they can do the next movement you know which is maybe pushing themselves up and eventually they start to move you know like a salamander or something across the floor that's also part of those reflexes and once they get that down then it's integrated now they can come into another reflex and that's the crawl you know they can start to crawl but they have to do this integration they have to be able to move and they can't sit in car seats and they can't you know they need to be on their belly when they're awake I know some parents are very afraid of sudden infant death and so they don't lay the babies on their bellies but they need to be when they're awake because they need to do they're exploring their bodies constantly and organizing these reflexes to integrate them into the whole system so that everything's working together if they don't do this and we see this so much today is i think parents too often are well a number of things one oh <laughs> is they're not allowing the children to crawl long enough they think oh if my kid can stand up they're you know advanced or something which is really bad because they need to crawl just that cross lateral movement of crawling helps to activate the eyes for eye teaming which will help them later for learning um, they need to be crawling until at least the age of one you know and very very important the other thing is these carriers that people have now where they're facing the baby out which like a shield on the parent this is so scary so here's the baby with all of its sensory information out with no protection you know if you turn the baby in so it's facing in against the body or if it's on the back facing in uh, it's protected it can hear the, the parents heartbeat and the other thing is is they are pushing their legs against the body of the parent they're not just dangling and right now OTs and PTs are just because these babies are dangling in front and it messes up the whole pelvic girdle system so that when they do start to crawl or walk they they don't have the organization in the body that they need they need to have something to push against like if they're on their bellies they're pushing against the, the floor the the bed or whatever with their legs and they need to be able to push against the parent with those legs to integrate those reflexes that have to do with this core the core muscles and the legs so that when they do crawl they can do it and then when they walk they're organized mm. and uh, then <laughs> then the children need to be able to explore they need to be climbing on furniture and they need to be outside climbing on things and it's interesting with uh, young children they're most they're cartilage there's a lot of cartilage in there so if they fall they kind of bounce it's not a big deal but they need to have that they need to find out where their limits are in their body what they can do and what they can't do they need to explore it and I think too many parents today are what we call helicopter parents that are oh here let me help you and I love it one of the places that I've learned a lot are these forest kindergartens in Scandinavia and the children go to these forest kindergartens they're um, they start about two and a half until six they go to these forest kindergartens five days a week five hours a day free um, 
and uh, well I should say the parents uh, are given leave for the first two years because they found that they don't have to pay for prisons on the other end so that the parents are with the children usually the first year the mother will be with the babies the second year the father and when they go back to work they have job security and then the children can go to these forest kindergartens and they're out in the forest learning from the forest and each other which is very complex anyway i just remember going to sweden just outside of stockholm and uh watching these children meet and then they walk about half a mile into the forest and they're not taking the trails they're climbing the rocks or over the the branches or something you know they're climbing and i see these little two-year-olds and they're struggling up on these rocks and my inclination is just let let me help you and, and the parent the adults say don't do it they need to understand their system they need to develop that vestibular system they do not help the children unless the children ask and if the children ask they say how shall i help you so the children have to come up with deductive reasoning like well put your hand under my foot you know and lift me up and so this is big you know the children are learning their bodies and how to ask for help the other thing is if they fall which sometimes they do the adults look at them and see that they're okay and then just lean down and open their arms but don't go to them and the children run into their arms and you know they cuddle them and pretty soon the kid is like okay okay and they're off playing so they're learning their bodies and we need to let children explore that they need to so badly and what we're seeing in our schools today is that these children have not explored the body. They haven't integrated these early reflexes and they can't read. They can't write. They can't sit still. And um, by the way, you know, when a kid you say, hey, I want you to really learn this, they start moving because as long as they're moving, they're going to take it in. Now what do we do? Say, sit still. And then they'll push back on their chairs so that, you know, they're activating that vestibular system, that balance system, so they can learn. Now what do we tell them? Sit still. And then we expect them to learn. It's goofy. <laughs> uh, yes. So. yes. Okay. So talking about when they come and then uh, they come to our school. So can you just touch down, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, but one of the reflex attending guard and just talk about um, implications for that and what it looks like unintegrated? Okay. So we have a very special reflex that occurs uh, when we're under stress. And what it does is get the gastrocnemius muscle, which is the big muscle in the back of your calf, the calf muscle ready to either run or fight so it's getting it ready and so what happens is we do a thing called a tendon guard reflex it tightens up those tendons the Achilles tendon that goes to the heel and the the tendon that goes behind the knee and hooks to the femur bone from the gastrocnemius so the back of the knees kind of lock okay and so you're ready to fight or flee now the problem with that is, is if you're not fighting or fleeing, it pushes the body off balance. So it either pushes it forward or backwards. And forward, you're getting ready to fight, but it's pushing the, the body forward or you're getting ready to run if you're pushed back. And what happens is all these muscles in the back tighten up. You know to hold your head up because you're forward and this head is three pounds and it's heavy or back so it, they, these muscles all tighten up and as they tighten up they pull down on the spinal cord okay and what can happen in as we get more have more and more stress is that you get slipped discs 
you get back problems, major back problems from that. So this tendon guard reflex, you know, it's getting you ready to fight or flee. Now, one of the things we're seeing in children today, and, and some adults, but mostly children, is what we call toe walking. And this is where they're way up on their toes, and it's because that tendon guard reflex is so tight. The back of the, the knees, the, the, ten, the Achilles tendon are really, really tight. Now, we do that as a survival thing, because if we don't do that, if we take off and we're not ready, it can tear the Achilles tendon, and then you get foot drop, and you can't fight, you can't run, you're dead. But in our children that are up on these toes like that, they are in fight or flight. It's a, a big indicator, this toe walking. And so getting the heels down is really important. And um, things like rebounders, or just having the children notice getting their heels down. Uh, I love that you're doing uh, this awkward turkey <laughs> exercise <laughs> that is getting, having the kids walk around in their heels. And also, what you can do is play with the children where you put your foot against their feet and then work their their feet so that those heels have to come down and so that there's more flexibility in the feet and um, we do a thing called foot flex where you're holding the achilles tendon and the tendons behind the knee and having the children point and then extend their feet but the more you can get that extension on that feet so that the heels are down the better Again, they can stand on the edge of a chi of a uh, step and get their heels down too. Oh, yeah, that's and a this not only applies to children but also to adults. Uh, you know, when I think about how many oh high heels I've worn in my life, <laughs> where I'm doing tendon guard reflex, you know, it's amazing. That <laughs> but so one of the things we see it does affect their ability to language, to speak. Because they're up on their toes, they're running from the saber-toothed tiger, they're not gonna talk. And so we see a delay in languaging. And the more you can get that heel down, the more they'll be able to language. That's fascinating to me. And is part of that just, you know, when you're under stress, it's just harder to learn? Yeah. Just all. Yeah, if you're running across the savanna with a tiger after you, you're not going to talk. <laughs> you're not going to learn. So, yeah, it makes it much more difficult to learn. Anytime we're stressed, this is important to know. Anytime we're stressed, the neocortex shuts down by 75 to 85%. We can't take information in. The other thing that we know is that if there is any stress on the system, it causes these special groups, the acetyl or methane group, to cause the DNA to, to close up. So it cannot be, the, mess, uh, the coding cannot occur on the messenger RNA to form proteins for memory. So whenever we're stressed, our memory goes way down. You know, in any stress, stops those new nerve cells from growing in our in our head you know that we're growing that we have the ability to grow do you ever have people tell you that they work better under stress i have and if they saw what was happening to their brain i think <laughs> people have said you stress like that's good stress and distress According to our physiology, there's either survival or there's no survival, okay? So there's either stress or no stress. And if you look at the biological system, uh, Salpolsky does a beautiful job of explaining it. Um, so if something is wonderful and exciting, and you know, like me skiing down big mountain and I'm really into it, 
that's for me excitement it is not stress okay and i can learn in those situations i'm always learning new things there's i travel around the world and it's amazing what people are doing and you you're amazing you're doing some really fun things to help you know students it's amazing it's really fun it's very creative and um but people do not do better under stress <laughs> right now we're seeing a big thing with this and it's called cell phone addiction and um there's an area of the brain right here that lights up and it's an area that has to do we see it light up with addiction it's the same area and um what happens is you actually decrease the ability of the hippocampus of the brain to function, which has to do with memory. So they've noticed that if students have cell phones with them in the classroom, even if they're turned off and they're taking a test, they do at least 30% worse than if the cell phone is nowhere to be seen, is gone. But what we see in this addiction is kind of a tough one because if the cell phone is gone, there's this anxiety, I'm missing something, and you know, where is it? So we need to be looking at our technology right now. I, I know Steve Jobs would not let his children near computers or cell phones until they were older. In the Waldorf and Rudolf Steiner, um, belief system in the first 11 years of life is when we're developing the global brain where we're able to get the big picture and understand things that we can then put into context more details and that during that time we need to be open to all of the sensory input that's coming into us from around from around us and what happens is when you get on that cell phone that's it, and it's zeros and ones. It's very limited of what you're taking in, and you won't remember it. So um, being careful with our technology, I love our technology, but I have, myself, I have to be very careful that I'm not overusing it. It needs to be balanced. And children, children are so sensitive. To these things the blue lights is there they're not sleeping well it makes it harder for them to learn and um, children shouldn't be anywhere near computers or cell phones and you in your book smart moves I think or maybe even more than smart moves awaken the child heart you do I think you said to seven years old did you say I said what was it seven years old you said I can't remember you kind of gave a time frame of like don't have them with interacting with electronics until a certain age, didn't I? Remember? About 11. Oh, okay. Yeah, wow. about 11. What you see is you start to see a whole different kind of growth at 11 when they start, their hormones start to change a bit. They're going into an adolescent stage and uh, the brain, I mean, just things are really changing. And that's a time when, at the age of 11 when they can start putting things together in a more organized fashion and, you know, take in and use the technological tools that we have in a creative way. We need to, but they need to have a base. They need to have a global base like they get. In the Chinese schools, they do Tai Chi every day, which is cross-lateral integrated movements. They take naps for a half an hour every day. And we know right now that during that deep delta sleep, when you're in those taking naps and you don't remember where you are, and that's, that there's light that is actually going from the hippocampus to the rest of the brain, downloading information into long-term memory. And we need that. And I know I was so disappointed in Hawaii when they took naps out of kindergarten. It was like, oh my gosh, this is so important. And, um, you know, I guess in a, a country like, like China where it's 
things are organized from the top down rather than the bottom up. They can make these statements and ban the cell phones in school. But it's something we should look at because, you know, the data's out there right now. We're seeing some real problems, more depression, more suicides, especially among our teens. And um, they need tools to help them stop stress. And I think the brain gym tools are the best thing I found worldwide. Oh, wow. You know? <laughs> They're easy. You can do them anywhere at any time. I see just miracles happen with them. Uh, people... Kids do so much better on testing if they get stuck when they're in a standardized test and they start doing their lazy eights just on their desk or on their legs, one hand, the other hand, both hands. They do far better on their testing. So <laughs> I love that you use the word miracle because um, that's, what, that's what I call my whole program when I work with people is movement for miracles because I've, yeah. I feel I've experienced crazy miracles as well. But what I love about your work is it, it just goes a little bit deeper to explain why, uh -huh. you know, makes it, my husband, when he first met me, used to call it woo woo until, well, we're into our marriage now and he gets that it's a lot more than that, but also he's experienced it for himself. Mm -hmm. So it's not so woo woo anymore. My husband is a world-class musician. He plays all the woodwinds. He's phenomenal. But every morning, he does his brain gym exercises. And uh, it's really cool to watch him do that. You know, he just feels like it's helping him stay young, stay active, stay alert, stay smart, mm -hmm. <laughs> healthy. Yeah, it's, it's a phenomenal program, I would agree. And you, I feel like you've given us so much information. As a matter of fact, I can't wait to watch it back and take notes on what I'm learning. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for all of this information. I really can't wait to watch it back and take notes. I, I'm thinking of people in my head as you're talking that need to hear what you're saying. And it's just so important. I'm, and... You know, Go ahead. Just, I want to add one thing because I think this is really important for parents to realize. Our children mirror us. Okay? If we're stressed, they're going to be stressed. The other thing is our children need us. They need our presence. Not our presence. They need us to be available, to really be there with them. Psychologists have said we need just somebody to actually listen to us, to be present with us for 15 minutes a day, for us to be comfortable to go out and live our lives and learn. And so when our children come to us, do we stop? Do we get down on their level? We look at them. We listen to them. Are we really present? Are we present with our spouses? I think right now the world needs that more than anything. And again, you know, back to our technology, I see so many people at dinner with everybody's got their cell phone. Instead of talking to each other, instead of communicating, our children mirror us. In order for them to learn to read, they have to hear us talk the analog of our speech, because digitized, it takes out about 80% of the harmonics and overtones that allow them to actually hear the words so that they can mirror them to speak them. Do they hear us speak and sing? You know, are they doing that with us so that when they come to the written word, they can make sense of the sounds and then read? Dyslexia is a hearing problem. They need to hear. They need to hear us speak. And then they'll be able to read. And they shouldn't be reading before the age of eight. Read to them. You know, <laughs> have them hear you. Wow. So I'm so glad you ended with that because it's so important. You're right. Just like stopping and being present. It's a huge message. It's huge. Yeah.
All right. So if people want to find you, I'll put some information under the video, mm -hmm. but where, where can they find you? What are you up to these days? I know that you made time in your busy travel schedule. You know, what are you doing? How can people find you, your books, all of that good stuff? So you can go www.carlahanniford.com is my website and it has, you know, where I'm going, what I'm doing. And uh, I'm always, always love to hear from people. It, in that website, it does have my email, though I don't get on the computer very often <laughs> if I can help it. And um, so... That's I think great. that's the best way. Uh -huh. All my books are on ebook at this point. Oh, great. Except for uh, the Awakening the Child Heart, that's out of print. But uh, the other three are on ebooks, and uh, uh, Smart Moves and Dominance Factor are in hard copy. Okay, and when you said out of print, you mean you're not printing it anymore? Yeah. Well, that's my favorite. Okay. Hey, I'm sorry, but it, it's in other languages. You can you can get. Uh, <laughs> oh wow! Uh, I have to awakening the child hearts, and I think it's in, in five other languages. Yeah. Oh, wow! Like you can kind of tell I love it. Oh wow! I know I've thought about it, but it, <laughs> it was with a different publisher, and it's just a little harder to. Okay. Well, yeah. that just means I'm going to have to get on and read to people sometimes. <laughs> maybe I'll read it. Maybe I'll read it in into audiobooks. It's actually the one that might be a good one for that. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. I, I I feel like I'm interviewing a rock star right now, which I am, but I just I've loved your work for so long. And when you emailed back that I was just wow, so honored and I'm so happy to have spent this time with you. I really hope we can connect again and do some collaborative stuff. It'll be fun. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Andrea, and keep up your good work. You're doing some amazing stuff. <laughs> Thank you so much.